Hello, everyone, and welcome to Rocky Mountain College of Art and Design's virtual visiting artist, scholar, and designer program event. I'm Gretchen Marie Schaefer, and I direct the VASD program. The VASD program is an interdisciplinary resource that values passionate curiosity and explores critical, diverse, and creative inquiry. We're honored to enrich the academic experience for all of our students and to engage the Denver Metro communities and beyond. Today is the second presentation in our world building series as we investigate the influence of art and design in this urgent moment in which we are building our world in extraordinary ways. As we gather today in the midst of a pandemic and a crucial reckoning with systemic racism and injustice in a landscape of both expansive connectivity and division, and at a time of rapid and dramatic social, political, technological, and environmental change, the World Building Series reflects on the specific methods artists and designers are implementing to actively develop radical progress and novel solutions. And we are thrilled to continue this exploration today by connecting all of you to the incredible artist Jacoby Satterwhite. After Jacoby's presentation, he will take questions from you all. Please feel free to enter your questions to the artist in the chat. Now, receiving your questions via chat also reminds me that I do want to acknowledge the strangeness of our current virtual reality. Even as we connect within the intimate settings of our homes, the distance that separates all of us is quite palpable, making me all the more grateful that you are here now as part of the shared experience, even if it is within this flawed and filtered space. So again, welcome and thank you for joining us. Now, Jacoby Satterwhite is a quintessential world builder. His unique mythology and visual language is made from a diverse and vibrant collection of personal, political, and cultural influences, including queer theory, video games, labor, desire, consumerism. As a creative polymath, his performances, sculptures, installations, music, and animations offer revelatory visions of carnal possibility. His rich visual lexicon also notably includes the creative legacy of his late mother, Patricia Satterwhite, celebrating her inventive drawings and soulful acapella vocals throughout his work. Jacoby's work has been exhibited extensively, including at Pioneer Works in New York, Whitechapel Gallery in London, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, the New Museum, and the Whitney. Last year, he collaborated with Solange Knowles on her visual album, When I Get Home. And he is currently an artist in residence at the Studio Museum in Harlem. Just a couple weeks ago, Jacoby's solo exhibition titled We Are in Hell When We Hurt Each Other opened at Mitchell Innes and Nash Gallery in New York. Amid his very busy and exciting schedule, we are so thrilled to have Jacoby here today as part of our world building series. And now it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Jacoby Satterwhite. Hello, everyone. Um, oh, great. Hi, everyone. I'm so glad to be here. I, um, I wish I was in there in person to be able to kind of engage you all and do studio visits and probably we would go after eat and really you know have something more personal but maybe in the future anyway so i guess i should get started um always like to start with this particular video as the foundational um gesso for my talks um this video is called the matriarch's rhapsody it is a 42 minute codex that um, basically archives and displays uh, on the left, my mother's drawings by uh, Patricia Satterwhite. Um, in the middle um, are architectural renderings of those drawings and on the right are videos where the drawings have been um, composited into um, video landscapes and also family photographs ranging 30 years um, that kind of showcase the material culture that these drawings of schematic objects are derived from. 
the story behind the drawings is that uh, my mother, when I was a child, uh, she was diagnosed with schizophrenia and leading up to that diagnosis, one of her practices was a sort of manic and um, hold on for a second, guys. Um, sorry. Uh, sorry, someone called my phone. This Zoom thing is really difficult. <laughs> so the, 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 story, the, the, the story behind the drawings is that um, my mother was um, diagnosed with schizophrenia when I was a child, and she kind of obsessively drew schematic diagrams and sent them to the Home Shopping Network to get patented. When I was a kid, I was fascinated by her rigorous kind of like technique and um, commitment to drawing and recording these songs that she will also try to send off for commercialization. Um, I thought it was a real practice. I thought it was her job and I begged to help her. Uh, my father would buy her these magnificent crayons and um, art utensils and stuff that I really, you know, just like salivated over and so I had to like learn how to build my skill set in order to help her and that was kind of like this weird naive genesis to my practice so when I was around like you know an adolescent I kind of deviated from her you know helping her and working with her because I realized it wasn't something I you know when you get older you you know, your own interest and so I end up studying you know I was studying like coding and gaming as a teenager and I was making paintings in my bedroom and then I went to boarding school and undergraduate and grad school and I really got um, obsessively um, submerged into like, I guess, an, an inquiry into the canon, you know. Um, while I was in school, I had a lot of frustrations and roadblocks with the medium of painting because as a black gay male in art school in the early 2000s, I guess I felt like my instructors really were trying to pare me down to this essentialist aesthetic of like, what, you know, like, why, what, what, why are you making this impressionist brushstroke as a black male? Or why are you, why are you quoting a su suprematist, suprematist move from Malevich or something? Like, what does that have to do with your identity? Everything was so, everything was under the umbrella of post-structuralism. And that was super, super frustrating for me. And so, I kind of like put the brush down and I wanted to kind of refuse painting and I started to pick up the camera and I started to experiment with performance and I later on I went home for Christmas and um, I saw my mother drawing still and I realized that those drawings became way more refined than when I remembered them and I, I noticed the line weight and the space and the composition and the double entendre and the language and the drawings were really really like some, I, I kind of realized that my art education heightened my sensitivity to the nuance of her personal language and expression. And I asked her, can I take these drawings with me to New York? Oh, to Baltimore and to New York. She said yes. And so over, the, over a few years, I didn't know what to do with the drawings, but I knew that I wanted to allow them to be in my orbit every time I did an experiment. So I started to kind of pretend like she was my Fluxus or Dada school collaborator, like in the Fluxus and the Dada and the Surrealist movement, where people would use scores and score uh, performance scores as inspiration for performances. That was like a you know like that, you know that was something that I studied in school, and so I was like, wow, I want to allow these drawings to become my scores for performance pieces. And so eventually, through trial and error, and going to Skowhegan. School for Painting and Sculpture and trying out new technologies like Arduino boards and After Effects and really just like learning to fail flamboyantly. I started to figure out that if I traced my mother's drawings and made vector lines out of them, I could build architectural renderings of them and I can bring back my painting language and I can make a pastoral concert like Titian. I can also composite my body on the green screen and I can really have a explore the fifth dimension of like, you know, of what I couldn't do when I was restrained to the canvas. So let's go to the next video, please. So, um, the first experiment, um, you can turn it down a little bit. So, 
The first experiment with the drawings that I found successful was Country Ball 1989, 2012. Country Ball 1989 to 2012 was basically my attempt at, like, how could I do an impressionist painting of a VHS tape from the 80s? How can I make an observational painting that's digital and moving image and 3D animated? How can I reperform this personal mythology on a green screen over 50 times, sewing costumes that are like matrix remixes of those fashion aesthetics? How can I like reperform the animism, the spirit of the objects that were inhabiting that space? And so I thought about my mother's drawings of American recreational material culture. I thought about her drawings of KFC pan buckets and pots and pans and carousels and monitors. And I thought um, it would be really interesting if I, you know, took those objects that I built architecturally and composited them into this, uh, into the viewport in Maya and I made a world where I could reperform and take agency over this narrative of my family's cookout in the 80s. That kind of was a period where we were really blue collar and there was a lot of um, like, you know, like the, the, the channel on the right is a heteronormative regular black family that didn't approve of homosexuality. And I was always kind of like composited next to the boys and kind of reoriented away from performing with the girls. And so there was a lot of interesting kind of um, nuances in the queer theory realm that you could observe in this video. But pairing it all the way down to just memory, I thought it would be interesting if I just revisited my body relate in, in the, my, my queer body with queer version of those objects and I took control over that memory. And so in Country Ball 1989, what happens in the 12 minute video is that it starts out like a very banal pastoral concert where it's just dancing and folly. And then as it proceeds to like move on, you start to see the decline of capitalism. You start to see barbecue uh, grills uh, disintegrate into ash and burn down architecture and you, like the video is just a, like an ongoing disintegration. It looks really happy and Barney like, but it's super, super sad actually. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to let it play for maybe two or three more minutes. Actually, can you fast forward the video please to the middle? All the way to the middle, like right there. No, yeah, back a little bit. That go like um, I'm gonna say 30 seconds back, or I don't just whatever, just keep playing, it doesn't matter. Just <laughs> sorry. And so I'm, if you notice, I'm performing on this weird object, but it's a drawing of a cake that my mother made. And it's something about scale and phenomenology that really kind of triggered a really happy moment in the way that I thought about the potentiality of space in the digital medium. Um, this is a really break, a breakthrough period for me in regards to like finding a template to work through for a couple of years. I guess we can proceed to the next video. So as after Country Ball, I started a series called Reifying Desire um, because I wanted to get away from the familial things in my work and I wanted to move towards just like really open-ended um, mythological narrative to kind of open up the terrain of what I could do with animation, performance, and sculpture. 
So the only rules with Reifying Desire was that each chapter had to be a different kind of gestation cycle. And the reason why I thought gestation cycles were a great pivot for me was because it was like when you, if you study animation at CalArts or any other animation school, like I guess the first thing that they teach you is how to do a flip book of a flower growing or a baby being born or, a, you know, like it's always about life. And so I wanted to, to like take the most banal kind of narrative and really heighten it to its extreme. So this is the final chapter of Reifying Desire, which premiered at the Whitney Biennial in 2014. And I I was the last person invited to the Whitney Biennial in 2014 when I was like 27 or 26. And so I had to really crunch and get it done and it was really crazy, but I knew I wanted it to be I, want, I knew I wanted to end the series big because I was like, wow, I, I want to run it. You know, I was like really excited about the show. And so I was like, what, what is the, like, how, what will be the ultimate gestation cycle? And what will be the ultimate kind of, uh, what would be the, what would be like a really great tongue in cheek way to like, finish this film? And so, I was thinking about, I was reading a lot of sexual politics theory and I was th thinking about like, um, in 2014, I think the uh, HIV and uh, preventive drug Truvada came out, which was like, you know, major, like, uh, you know, it was, a, it kind of uh, stigmatized a lot of things in regards to like, queer sexuality and, and so I invited this porn star who was vilified for having a lot of bareback sex and porn in the early 2000s uh Antonio Biagi to be in the film because a lot of people thought that he was a bad example for gay guys and just, like promoting unsafe sex and all this stuff like that and and and, and I guess I was like well if, you know I, I realized there was a major paradigm shift with like this drug so I thought like wow he could be my he should be my final gestation cycle so I hired him to be the person who would inseminate me with a baby in this video and that's kind of what the narrative is it's really silly and ridiculous I can't believe it took me this long to tell you that but another layer of this video too is that it's still about observation a lot of this video I shot the live action scenes and um can you fast forward a little bit to like I don't know I would say Give me, yeah, like stop right there. Keep going. Just let it play. Um, so, it's a this is a long video, it's 24 minutes. Um, But a lot of the live action scenes were shot in New York City and Chinatown. And I wanted to, you know, like I'm obsessed with the idea of sketching in public, performing in public, using my 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 live action scenes as a sketchbook for how I'll render architecture space and build worlds when I'm home, when I'm working on a computer. So a lot of the like spatial decisions in the video are referencing the landscape of New York, which you would see if I, I allow this whole video to play. Unfortunately, it's a long video, so we won't get to the kind of metropolis parts, but formally this video is much more so about process than like some of those like queer layers that I just introduced. Um, you know, I kind of feel like all of my videos are meta narrative and operate like a sort of a sheet cake. There's the process narrative, there's the conceptual narrative, there's the queer narrative, there's the personal narrative. And that's, a, that's I guess that is what you call the fragmentization of, uh, and the crystallization of a world builder. And so you can see this uterine subway, which is, which you'll see how I'm on a subway in this video and it becomes anthropomorphized into this uterus shape.
Um, also, can uh, are uh, I'm not sure if I. I hope I gave you. Did I give you images? Or just video? Yes, you gave me images. Okay, so maybe we can. Well, we can let this. How much time do we have left? Because I want to measure how much I should talk about Reifying Desire versus the other images and then new project. Um, so we have like 20 minutes. We have plenty of okay, time. okay. Good. So, um,. Let's proceed to the images. Okay, so this is my exhibition at Pioneer Works last year, but um, after Reifying Desire was done, I was like figuring out what I was gonna do next. And I had a meeting with a curator from San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and they offered me a very, very large commission to do whatever I wanted for two years as an artist in residence there. Um, and so I told, I, I kind of got drunk in the meeting and I was like, I want to do an album, but I'm in it. And I was like, I want to do an album. I want to, I want to, I want to turn my mother's songs that she wrote in the mental hospital into an electronic record, like a trip hop record. Um, I think, you know, they're very weird, melancholic, strange folk American songs that I thought would like really, that, that were really raspy on these broken cassette tapes. She used her thigh as a metronome, just really compelling stuff. And I was embarrassed by it as a kid. Oops, sorry guys. Um, so I thought like, I wanna make this, this, this thing and they were like, fine, do that. But I. I was like, I want to make it a visual album. And this was before Beyonce was doing her visual albums and stuff. This was like a long time ago. And I, I, I wanted it to be like a virtual reality headset album, like the album that you wear on your head. And you had to look up, down and left, right, and you had to listen to it five times. So you can experience it on the X axis and the Y axis and the Z axis. And I had all these theories about it. And it was all about sculpture and bringing the object hood back to the record and I wanted to perform it live everywhere and you know they were like great so I performed I you know I they so I got the budget and I split it with my one of my best friends who's a musician a techno electronic musician and I learned a lot about Pro Tools and Ableton and we made we spent two years experimenting and making this crazy record and getting people to sing on it and write on it and it's all my mother's vocals, but they're like a cellist playing on it. And it was really a complex and painterly album. Um, and uh, while I was making the album, I was also doing live performances in nightlife and in the museums. And I was really just kind of like integrating myself in the world and getting as much inspiration I can for this new body of work. I was also like filming people constantly on the green screen. I was um, going to Fire Island with the green screen in my backpack. I was um, putting it up in hotels and like finding anyone and everyone to just sort of like do these weird performance gestures to kind of like inspire me to figure out how can I like create an hour and 24 minute film related to this album. It took forever. And so like the project ended up being a sort of a, a trilogy um, in regards to how it was presented because the first video was Blessed Avenue and that was shown at Gavin Brown Enterprise. Um, in 2018, after I did all the performances at SF MoMA. And then the second um, exhibition was 2019 at Pioneer Works, and it had an adjacent exhibition of sculpture related to the films at um, the Fabric Workshop Museum. And the final exhibition of this project has just opened at my gallery, Mitchell Lindsay Nash. Um, this show is called We Are in Hell When We Heard Each Other. But I don't know, can you go, can you click, play more, can you go to the next image, please? This neon is the track list of the album. We made a record shop at Pioneer Works. They've like made a vinyl for the, we produced 
um, we, we produced the album uh, as a vinyl, put it on Spotify and iTunes, and we set it up like a fake tower record store where you could like, instead of listening stations, you put on a VR headset and you could listen to the album while watching Domestica, the film that is related to the album, but it was in 360. So it was really, really crazy like that. Um, could you go to the next slide? This is the record shop. Could you go to the next slide? These cabinets are referencing um, the intro to the film Moments of Silence. So they were like these geometric abstract paintings I wanted to make that kind of have 3D prints and animated videos um, embedded on them. They're kind of like um, Sears entertainment centers, but remixed in a painter, painting. Uh, they kind of like, are supposed to reference like, you know, consumerist entertainment centers where you put TVs on, but they look like geometric abstract paintings and they also kind of have this composite. They're like domestic, but they mix with formalism and I kind of like love exploring it. And they have augmented reality components on them too. Can you get the next slide? This one's called American Shrine for the American Dream. Next video. Shrines for Drug Designs. Next video. This is the two channel version of Blessed Avenue. Um, the whole uh, hour and 12 minutes of the series played at this exhibition. Could you do the next slide? This is a room with my mother's drawings and her lyrics. Um, it was adjacent to the exhibition, so you could, you know see the context of where it all started. Next slide. This is a listening station of my mother's acapellas for the album that we took all the acapellas from to make the record. Next slide. Use the lyric sheets. Next slide. Close-ups for shrines and drug designs. So basically, they're kind of like these weird wonderlands. They're like the Indian in the cupboard in this really cool way. It's really funny. Um, next slide. Next slide. Next slide. These are just close ups. Next slide. So the 3D printing and painting, the 3D prints are really fun for me. I mean, I really am trying, I'm, I'm tiptoeing back into my painting language, and that's really, really fun. So I can't wait to go full throttle. Oh, yeah, this is the record. Um, at the VR station where you can listen to the album. Next. These are posters for the album. Next. More installation shots. Next. Blessed Avenue. We did lots of performances on this stage. So the exhibition was kind of like this thing where you could act, I, I brought in various activations while the like film was playing. It was very, it, it, it was really cool. Next. This is um, a sculpture I created at the Fabric Workshop. They are 3D prints derived from my mother's drawings of, you know, these weird anthropomorphic, sexualized, remote control penises that are, like dry. They're so weird. And I kind of like the absurd, it's surrealist, phantasmagora. Uh, you know, aesthetic of it, and I just wanted to like realize it. I wanted to be able to like activate it with augmented reality in the future. I'm planning on making a film related to this composition next year and re uh, exhibiting this sculpture. So, like, this is just a teaser into something that will happen probably soon. Next, uh, next one. This sculpture is called Room for Doubt. It is exhibiting in my exhibition at Mitchell Lens and Nash right now. It's based on Caravaggio's painting, Doubting Thomas, a painting that was used in a Renaissance to promote faith in the church, um, to promote ritual. Uh, the allegory in the, of the painting is about the skeptic because St. Thomas is skeptical of Jesus's uh, mortality. And so he's touching his womb to make sure he's real. 
Um, I've been revisiting that painting for many years of my life, many different reasons. Personal, my personal health reasons. I kind of feel like it has to do with like my relationship with art making. But I realize now it just has so much of strange. Uh, oh, also like inside of the videos is I wish I could show it to you, but I'm doing a performance piece where I am naked. Um, painting my body is like dragging up and down this 20 foot long xerox of a virus and i am de uh, redacting it with my body and so it's sort of like my body is this immune so is this immune immune agent that's like it's like antibody that's like destroying a virus inside of each of those figures wounds and so it just feels very hypochondriac and paranoid and it, it really kind of it, it has a whole different meaning this year if you know what i mean so and then it functions really crazily in context of what i've been talking about in my new work um can we go to the next slide please this is a larger version a larger uh, uh this is a oh yeah and it's also like seven feet tall the next slide is it a video oh uh let's skip this one this is a sculpture more sculpture. Next. This is room for ascension, by the way. Next. The uh, these are uh, virtual reality station. Uh, next. Uh, yeah. So this is a trailer for the visual album. Moments of silence. The series is five videos. Um, so I'm not going to talk about it. So you can, well, I could talk about it. Actually, um, a lot of the live action shots are derivative of Nigerian Gelati masquerade rituals that I was inspired by from reading a lot of Robert Ferris Thompson and stuff. Um, I wanted to kind of like do these weird reperformances of matriarch worship just to kind of be like a tongue-in-cheek kind of irreverent way of exploring the personal narrative in my work in regards to like my maternal collaboration so you will see a lot of baptism and hanging and renewal and ritual and relating death and i don't know the, it's a very cosmic open-ended long piece so it's hard to kind of composite what it's fully about within this talk you can ask questions about that during the Q&A though. This is Blessed Avenue chapter. Maybe you could turn it up a little and I can just, well, you can just watch it. Oh, okay, you can play um, this chat. This is the, this is a trailer for my new piece, We Are In Hell when we, each, when we Heard Each Other, which is the final chapter of the series.
video when I saw and this is the one you know from your current exhibition um, it the lyrics in particular really resonate I think with this one moment this current moment right like not not going back mm -hmm. um, being home and not being alone um, there's something just like really um, powerful about those lyrics and then of course all of your incredible visuals I'm just kind of curious about your when you made this video um was it all during the pandemic and 
just preparing for that exhibition right now, like your experience in making work in this moment. And um, yeah, I'm just curious about that. If that had impacted your, your usual process in any way um, or yeah. Absolutely. Uh, well, so I finished my, my Pioneer Works exhibition and Fabric Workshop Museum exhibition both went up at the exact same time in September, October. They went down in, in November last year, 2019. So if you do the math, I had to start fresh after that. And I think that like, yeah, like I was kind of gestating the ideas starting from October last year and I worked, I finished the film the day before the exhibition. Like, you know, like the films take so much the labor is 3,000 layers deep because there's like the green screen performances. There's sculpting the, the polygonal architectural models. There's mo-capping, the, the, the motion capturing the figures um, and, comp and compositing them in the space in a very choreographed and elegant way. It's just so many factors. And then there's building visual harmony and narrative thread and ideas and concepts and it's just so much to tackle so you know i'm negotiating these variables while taking on side commissions for a whole year and yeah it's i mean during the pandemic and the civil unrest it was it nearly drove me completely mentally ill i don't know how i got it done but i'm glad i did um it i could not help but reflect our current time my mother uh, it's weird because I guess I've I've always kind of lived my life on this weird marginalized edge, like since I was a child. My, you know, like in regards to like, I grew up in a very like weird low income neighborhood and we were really poor and like sick all the time. And my, you know, it wasn't really that great. So I guess like the my mother was always singing the blues and always making poems and drawings about hope and about um, just like hoping to like. Like it was sort of like she was praying to capitalism to find her way out. And I think because that's what my work is a, seems to be reflecting on, it felt very relevant. I think like the ideas would have always came out the way they came out, but this era, this time, because I worked from observation, I couldn't help but like work with a sense of immediacy and urgency and be very literal and to the point and like make stuff about, you know, like make these pieces that kind of express black survival, black resilience and immunity and a, a utopian world that's postmodern that's like post postmodern in a way where like figures are divine and refined and 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 even though like they are living in a world where it's like a simulacra of doom they are still surviving so yeah i'm i'm very much so kind of work you know i work every day and yeah it clearly reflects now yeah any other questions yeah, we do have some more questions. Um, this one's from Jess. Uh, she says, you mentioned the pastoral as a motif in some of your work, and I see it reappear in this last work you just showed. Can you elaborate on this motif and why it appears? Well, pastoral concerts are usually just like these pa what, like <laughs> painters, um, like Titian and Manet, it's sort of like these like weird tribute tribute spaces to like leisure and arts and poetry and music. But also Manchin, Manet's Luncheon in the Grass is a much more controversial depiction of a pastoral concert because he decided to portray the bourgeoisie and the ordinary and the mundane and the banal and the nude figure on a large scale painting. And at the time painting was only reserved for the elite and the divine to be portrayed. And so that painting was, you know, often called the, the, the father to mother, the father or the mother to, mother to modernism. And so I wanted to invert the idea of that painting. I wanted to invert the pastoral concert and make this like dystopian and sane, crazy, um, nature scape that is full of disease and biological threats and 
golden Tyvek suits and living ant trees that are, you know, and protest and, and, and garbage media that is reinforcing the simulacra of systemic racism. But I wanted to also show, but you, but you, but, but within that pastoral concert, it's the only like thing that is immune and surviving and resilient are these weird, crazy cyborg black female figures. And then it ends with a landscape trip like flower bed of Brianna Taylor. So it's just kind of like, that's just what I had to do. I never worked that literally. And because my mother's songs felt so Anthony, I felt, why not make an Anthony video? I hope that makes sense. Um, we do have a few more questions. Um, I think this question is from a student um, and is asking um, because you know, these your projects are quite expansive. Were there ever times you felt stuck in your process or in your progress of a project and you didn't know where to go, what to do next? Um, sort of how do you tackle that, especially you know when you're working with these big institutions, you have deadlines. How do you address that? It's hard. How do I, could you ask that? Actually, I, I like that question, but could you ask it again so I can make sure I heard what I heard? Yeah, um, just the vastness of your projects. They're so huge and multi-layered. Um, are there ever times that you get stuck and don't know what to do or where to go next? And how do oh, you- Oh, all the time, all year long, it's really depressing. It was funny because this project was took me five years to do, like the whole visual album. And so it like consumed five years of my life marinating what to do, whether I was in a club or at a on the bus or in the subway or you know, in my room. Like I was completely consumed by trying to figure out and how to resolve this giant piece that I knew it, I would have to live with for the rest of my life and have to tour it around the world and stuff and exhibitions. And so, yeah, it's really daunting and it kind of takes over my personal well being. And so I don't want to ever do projects that big again. I kind of want to work differently, but I'm glad I got it out of my system. Yeah, it's how do I, I don't know how I just, I, you know, you just took. It took 100% commitment. I, I only worked, I only did artists and residency programs. I, wrote, I, I applied to grants. Like I couldn't take on another job while making a project like this. I had to work full time to do it. So it's just committing 100% of my life to it is what the only way I could have done it. Um. This question's I find interesting and maybe related to some of the lyrics in this last video again. Um, so for people not interested in getting back to, quote, getting back to normal, post COVID and post the various societal reckonings of this moment, what's the one thing about the business of contemporary art that you would like to leave behind? Um, or um, oh, things that I mean, we shouldn't go back to? What, do I, what would I like to leave behind? Um, world, yeah. I don't know a lot of things. <laughs> uh, I don't know. It's funny because so much is gone. So I don't know. I feel like I'm. I feel like I miss all the bad things because it. I feel like I have maybe. I feel like I developed Stockholm syndrome to it or something, where it's just like I like I even liked art fairs because I could go to parties afterwards. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't really know what I want to leave behind. I can't answer that question because I mean I'm I'm because right now it's just so crazy. I just hope that some kind of normalcy comes back. Um. So um, Shane is asking if you could address a little bit about the emotional complexities in, in you know, integrating so much of your mother's work as such intimate source material. Um, and just there is no, it's all objective. It's kind of sociopathic. Um, and I don't mean, I have to say it like that because it's just like, yeah, I, it's a part it, that the catharsis of dealing with something so personal and vulnerable and turning it into an objective form 
it has you have to work from a bird's eye view in order to make it result and that was a tension i wanted to deal with because i knew that's the only way i could make something interesting it's like if i dealt with something that is so embarrassing and i made it very cold callous and impersonal it was just you know something i committed to a long time ago and and and, and as i get older i feel like hmm that was interesting <laughs> but I think it was a good experiment because yes, I do have a, my personal real relationship with that material is a lot different from the way it comes across in the work, but making it into my work, it was the healthiest way I could deal with a lot of that shit, you know? Um, but I felt like outside of it being coming from a place of trauma, her drawings are dope. She's a genius. She made amazing, she's dead now, but she made amazing drawings. She had amazing music. She's a genius. I, I, I feel like I am just like her, you know, like not like, I feel like I'm just like her in regards to like, I learned a lot from her from working with her material for so many years. So I'm become just like her in regards to like my aesthetic tendencies and like all of my, so now, even though I'm like leaving that work, all of my aesthetic decisions feel like her in a way. It's this weird tutelage thing that happened from using the archive for so long. But I also use other archives too. I use like performance footage from people I put on the green screen or the internet or like, you know, like I'm a collector. I'm like a, a hoarder, a digital hoarder. So like, she's just the most personal thing that bleeds through. And I, you know, I had, it was a five year long project. So, you know, in the future, it'll look like one little thing because it, it really, I just wanted to make an hour and 24 minute film and I want to make Refined Desire and then, just, yeah. So there we go. This might have some overlap with that last one, but um, in some ways, but uh some of the other topics you you tackle in your work brooklyn's asking about what inspired you to address taboo topics um specifically they mentioned sex and queerness what it means to be black in today's society um i never saw it as taboo it was just i think the ah, sorry i have back problems so i have to lay in this bed <laughs> um i never saw it as taboo I just saw it as it was I, I don't know I you know I grew up seeing all kinds of crazy performance art and Viennese actionism and I was the the kind of conversation and criticalities I was hanging around at the time that we were on the edge and that was the the life that I was living and the things that I were seeing and it just kind of came through the work but it didn't, it was more about carnality. And when anytime you see something sexual in the work, it's just, you know, it's just a gesture or a metaphorical kind of glaze that kind of like, it's just a metaphor. It's just basically like, it's, it's, it's just, um, just a silhouette for carnality and, 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 and primalism. Like whenever I'm juxtaposing some weird, slave master dialectic in a BDSM format next to like climate change imagery. It's more so about complicit, complicity or something. Like it's very like meta, like I use, I use sexuality as a code user. It's never strictly about the sex. I'm not even like, I don't think about it as sex. I think about it as a code or a metaphor or a missing scene or something anytime it's being used. Next question. So Reagan asks, um, uh, how does the sense of scale play out in your work? I see lots of micro and macroism. Is this a reflection on current times? Do you see things repeating on a micro and macro scale? It seems to be intentional in your work or is it perhaps subconscious? Um. Well, uh, the reason why they're, I'm, I, it's because I usually, ex usually when these films are shown, they're projected on massive walls. So like a macro kind of image kind of feels like a close up of something really big, you know, like when it's really large and it's like life size and you're standing 
and you're watching these images, it has a different aesthetic and feel to it when it's on your phone or your laptop. There's definitely an understanding that these like large landscapes and there's close ups. Um, and for me, it's more about, I was just interested in making Renaissance tableaus that are moving and storyboarding them. Um, like, I also like making images that I can print as wallpapers. Cause you know, when you print stuff, like basically there are lots of, there's lots of information like a Bosch painting. And I want, I want, I want, I want them to kind of like, yeah, I want to have multiple entry points in the work where you have to watch it like 200 times in order to get all of the layers and allegories. So yeah, there, the, 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 um, I don't know if I answered that question correctly, but there is, I do actually think about micro and micro, micro and macro binaries a lot in regards to the, my, my visual narratives and strategies for filmmaking. Um, I think we can maybe take a couple more questions. Um, so those of you who haven't asked something, please put it in the chat. We'll do a couple more. Um, uh, this one asks, if any, what emotions or reactions do you want others to feel and have while viewing your work, uh, especially um, uh, the desire video piece, the rarefying desire piece we watched earlier? What, do, what emotions do I want people to feel from it? Or reactions, yeah. Oh, I don't, I don't want, I don't care. <laughs> That's what art, art is, I, you know, you have to meet me halfway. And whatever you get from it is what you get. Art is an exchange. I give you a three thousand percent of myself, and whether you feel repulsed, then I'm sorry. Or and if you feel great, then uh, that's great. But like, if you feel enlightened, that's great. But it's just an exchange. It's a discourse. So I, it's not my responsibility of what you get from it. But I am giving you my all every single time, and I and it's always earnest, and it's never shocking. Trying to be shocking. It's just, I, I really can't afford to be trying to be shocking. I have to survive, but I can't help but be myself. And sometimes the decisions that I make are incredibly vile and embarrassing and strange. But as an artist, I have to do what I have to do. I can't do anything but what I want to do and what I need to do. So I don't know, it's whatever you want to feel. Um, and kind of, you mentioned the word in this last question um, about embarrassment. Um, and so the question is, uh, you know, how do you get your headspace um, to kind of push that edge of your comfort zone? Um, you know, you've talked about embarrassment before in your work too. And how do you, um, how do you experience that? How do you get into that space? Do you become another kind of character in your work? Um, and what does that feel like in the moment? And then how does that play out um, as you progress through a project? Well, embarrassed, I never, well, it's more like, you know, you're making a strong mark if it feels out, out of your comfort zone. And it's all, at the end of the day, art is about mark making. And so whenever I like, Feel like I really believe in a project I do whatever means necessary to get the result that I need and I don't want to humiliate anyone else by having them model in a compromising way for my own weird vain narcissistic exploration so I use my own body and I own myself most of the time and a lot of times I feel foolish and ridiculous like executing some of these things and torturing myself and punishing like there's lots of masochistic performance that goes into what I do and so, I don't know, it's just, but that's the, that's what good art is about sometimes. It's about like really driving yourself to a certain kind of exhausted middle ground, negotiating between what you can and cannot do. I mean, it's, it's a fight. Um, it's just about gravity. I mean, that's what embarrassment is. It's not like, oh, I'm so embarrassed. I have pride and I'm ashamed. It's more about, I'm really, I'm negotiating my boundaries in order to get the result I need for this art production. And whenever that tension comes around, I know I'm doing something good. But lately, I don't want to get there. So I'm probably going to enter a bad phase. <laughs> I guess I might sneak one more question in here of what you have coming up. Um, I have, I'm doing the, I have a lot coming up. 
I'm doing the Athens Biennial next year, the Gwangju Biennial in South Korea. I'm doing the Front Triennial in Cleveland, Ohio, the Monk Triennial in Oslo. Um, uh, showing the Birds in Paradise series with a visual album at the Tate Modern as, as part of a solo presentation screening thing that they're doing. I'm, I have a three floor show at Carnegie Mellon. That's gonna be like sort of a soft survey of 10 years of work next year. Um, and uh, end of the residency show at the Studio Museum in Harlem. And uh, yeah, a few other things. A lot of work to do. Working on a commercial project with a musician that I'm excited about. Yeah. Well, with all of that, I feel just so um, grateful again to you for being here as part of our series and sharing your work with all of us. And um, I do sincerely just wish that um, all those things happen smoothly and um, safely and all those projects can, <laughs> that we all can enjoy those projects. Um, definitely, if folks are in New York, uh, check out Jacoby's exhibition that's up now. Again, thank you so much for sharing your work um, and your insights, quite generous. Um, I appreciate it. And um, thanks everyone for, for joining us today. Please be sure to take care of yourselves, take care of each other, and we will see you next time. Talk to you later. Bye.